Next question, very good points. It is illegal for a design professional to stamp drawings for an out-of-state unlicensed design firm unless a thorough review is performed. Trick question, Dan. <laughs> the <laughs> answer is, is Laura, can, can I borrow your lawyer's hat? Because I'd like to get the lawyer's <laughs> answer. It depends. It depends. <laughs> and it depends on what state you're in. Welcome to Talk to Me About a and &E, a podcast series focused on risk management for architects and engineers. Host Dan Bulow, Managing Director of Willis a and &E, will engage experts across the a and &E spectrum on topics ranging from contract details to the broadest trends impacting design professionals in North America. Hello and welcome to Talk to Me About a and &E. I'm Dan Bulow, Managing Director of Willis a and &E, and our program today is part two of our review of the DPIC Liability IQ. I'm joined by Laura Gorliardo, Managing Director of Design Professional Liability Claims for Travelers, and Mark Blankenship, Director of Risk Management for Willis a and &E. Both Laura and Mark were claim managers for DPIC back in 1997, when I was also with DPIC on the underwriting side of the house. If you haven't listened to part one of our review of the Liability IQ, I suggest you do. Now let's get back to my discussion with Laura and Mark. All right, next question. This is to Laura. The word install as used in specifications carries with it the understanding that the item to be installed will be supplied by the party performing the installation. Not necessarily. I think what they're looking for back when this question was uh, created many moons ago was around the at-risk exposure that a firm might find themselves if they're in their self-performing or hiring trades or anything to that. I think is where that's going. But uh, I, what are your thoughts? No, and and I agree with you, Dan. I think that is where it comes from. I mean, you know, it it to a certain extent, it used to be a little easier to talk about who were the contractors and and who were the design professionals and what they what they did. Those lines have kind of blurred through the evolution of the time that I've been in the industry. And the concept of install is certainly something that is not that which a design professional would generally be doing. It is something that is viewed more as a contracting aspect. But the concept of install also has certain parameters of what it's meant to be, that it's simply that act of putting it in, not necessarily deciding how it goes in, not necessarily deciding what's put in, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure the contract is basically saying what it is you intend to do. And if there is something that is there that is not part of what you're doing, don't take that on. I've certainly had many a design professional who's been asked to, well, you take on, you contract with this entity, whether it's a, a geotech or whether it's perhaps a, a specific contracting entity. Hey, design professional, do me a favor. Contract with this entity for me because I just don't want to have to go through the process of my uh, requisition to, to get it. So, hey, do me a favor, take this on. Well, that has awfully big implications because no matter what, you're then responsible for whatever it is that other entity is doing. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that can become a very bad issue because you have then vicarious liability. You're going to be held responsible for whatever it is that entity does. And if that entity does not have adequate insurance or for whatever reason their insurance is not applicable, guess who's holding on to it? I guess who may have a coverage issue. And right. guess depending who may have on a what the you know, their policy reads. Okay, so, Mark. Dan, I think this question is most relevant to architects and engineers as specification writers. And the point being, use language precisely to say that the mechanical uh, contractor will install the HVAC equipment leaves open the question, who's buying the equipment and who's furnishing it? Uh, so there are those who assume that the word install means to provide all labor and incidental materials to place the item of work in a completed and usable state. Right. But 
it's little less than crystal clear. And if I was working on a public project, uh, I would look for every opportunity I could to submit change orders to pad my profit margin after my, my bid has been accepted. And one way that change order artists accomplish this is by looking for ambiguities in the specifications. So this is, I think, a lesson in, in using precise writing. Yep. Excellent points. And again, you know, it depends on what the design professional scope of services is and, and what they are offering as a professional firm. Most design firms are not integrated firms offering at risk. Most firms are not doing CM at risk or EPCM, or but some do. And if you do, that's fine, but you better make sure that you have the right insurance, which may very well not be your professional with some of this exposure and risk you're taking on. So again, another good point there. So Mark, owners should be able to feel secure that a competent design professional's estimates can be treated as a guaranteed maximum cost. Oh, I love this one. You know, most people's experience with the word estimate it relates to auto insurance. And they got in a fender bender and they went to the body shop and they got an estimate. And then the car got fixed for the amount of the estimate, you know, to the penny. What we as design professionals offer is opinions of probable construction cost. I think the more precise use of language operates to refine the expectations to a more accurate level. I would agree with that. Laura? I would agree yeah. wholeheartedly. Mark's comment on the expectation. We're right back to that concept of managing the expectation. And words and are important. Yeah. The words are important. Also, I would say that this question, when it was probably at the time wasn't written to consider this, but in this day and age, we've seen a real influx in design build infrastructure claims, right? And uh, and a big problem with design build is when they are setting these guaranteed maximum prices or these firm b uh, budgets around incomplete set of drawings. And, and so we're starting to see, in fact, most design build infrastructure claims reportedly are coming in before the start of construction. Pretty much says it all, right? Oh, without question. I mean, it, we'll just look at the last few years and the supply chain issues we've had. Yeah. I mean, the concept with the supply chain issues. I mean, how is someone, a design professional who is not the construction procurement group, how are they aware of what the heck is going on with the prices of drywall, concrete, steel? You can right. have ideas, but you're not going to be have your finger on the pulse of it because it's not your day to day. Okay, next question. This is for both Mark and Laura here. You should strive to get a prevailing party clause in your agreement. Well, Dan, I think you mean prevailing party gets attorney's fees, right? right. Yes. I would say no because this is a contractual liability in the event that it is used against you. Well, either way, it's a contractual liability uh, because here in America – uh, we follow the American rule, which is everybody pays their own lawyer. Uh, in England, they follow the English rule, surprisingly. And uh, the prevailing party there can collect back their attorney's fees from the party who's unsuccessful. And I guess that's there to encourage dispute resolution. But in America, everybody pays their own. And this can be a hammer used against you in a claim. And let me propose a scenario to you. You are sued for a million dollars. You think the claim is only worth 10,000. Uh, you offer $10,000, it's not accepted. They go to verdict, they get $10,000. Are they now entitled to their prevailing party attorney's fees, which were by the way, $350,000, based on that contractual clause. Because and if you think I'm making this up, I'm not. <laughs> I know, because they prevailed. <laughs> they prevailed. So A, strike yeah. the clause. B, so, if you can't strike it, define prevailing party, something like the party who who comes within 75% of the, of the actual verdict or something. And I'm, Laura, I, I know you've seen this over here. And oh, yeah. My favorite story is the, you know, 106 discrete issues of which the developer owner won three that totaled about $80,000. But somehow yeah. or another managed to, they quote unquote prevailed mm -hmm. on three. Right. 
Okay. So it's interesting. We- yeah. So to that point, what's the definition of prevailing? And it's interesting when this question was originally written, you know, 30 plus years ago, the advice was, yes, you want this in there with the concept of, you know, usually it's not the design professional going to raise frivolous claims. But now that we've gotten into it, you have this contractual liability concern. You have this definition of prevailing concern. So I think it's good advice that we're getting here. Okay. Uh, next one here. You should strive to negotiate a limitation liability clause in every professional service agreement. I'm going to ask Mark to feel this. I know this is near and dear to your heart. Well, I think we should try. And it, it has to do with balancing the risks and rewards of the project. If you think about you know, the project compared to the construction costs, the owner has this building they can derive economic benefit from. And when they get tired of it, they can sell it. They get an enormous benefit from doing the project. The contractor, his profit was probably more than the design professional's entire fee. So uh, I think it's it's appropriate that the design professional's liability should be limited in contract. And, and Laura, I don't know if you have any other good arguments that you might add other than the fairness argument. I think fairness is a definite strong argument there. The concept of the limitation of liability, though, and and if you're going to put them in, and I do encourage you put them in, you have to keep a couple things in mind. One is that the limitation of liability, depending on the state you're in, has to follow certain requirements in order to be enforced by the courts. So you really need to make sure that you're going back and finding that trusted attorney in the area to be able to give you the information that you need to make sure that you're meeting those requirements so that it's enforced. The other thing, use it as a conversation tool with your client. Talk about it with the client. This is why. This is why I'm asking for it. This is yeah. where I think it comes into play. And understand that this is and negotiate that number, whatever it's going to be. I think that's important. And in fact, how much insurance do you want? If you need more, I'll go get some more. But I want to limit it to the liability, at least to the proceeds. I mean, ideally, it's to a dollar amount that's reasonable, but at the very least to the proceeds of available insurance, right, at the time of settlement. Yep so that uh, you're not sitting out there potentially exposing your business any more than and then over and above your insurance. That is true. The, okay. The, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me add just no, one more please. thing, Dan. I just do want to reinforce, though, to folks that a limitation of liability is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. Right. It is only applicable to the contracting parties. Good point. And so if you are being pursued by some third party such as someone who's been injured or otherwise, the limitation of liability is likely not to help you there. And so although there's certainly something that helps out and is worth considering and worth discussing with your client, you just can't look at it as a get out of jail free card. Next question, very good points. It is illegal for a design professional to stamp drawings for an out-of-state unlicensed design firm unless a thorough review is performed? Trick question, Dan. <laughs> the <laughs> answer is, is Laura, can, can I borrow your lawyer's hat? Because I'd like to get the lawyer's <laughs> answer. It depends. It depends. <laughs> and it depends on what state you're in. And what are you, an architect or an engineer for that matter? That's right. Generally, it is illegal to stamp somebody else's plans because you're not complying with the statute, the licensing statute that says uh, you will only seal plans that are prepared under your direct supervision. However, certain states, let's take Illinois, for example, do allow it under certain circumstances. Illinois, uh, unlike most states, has a separate structural engineering license. And therefore, it is permissible for an Illinois structural engineer to seal the plans of an out-of-state unlicensed engineer, provided that the Illinois licensed engineer does all the math, all the calculations necessary to create the documents in the first place and save evidence that they did so. And then it is actually legal. But that's the exception rather than the rule. And I think, again, we, we touched on this earlier. It really is important to know where you're doing business and what the laws in that state. Because, again, practice acts, economic loss doctrine, anti-indemnity statutes, statute of limitation repose will and can vary from state to state. Right, Laura? That is so true, Dan. And to be honest, that's the challenge. And, you know, we talked about 
the dabbling in the areas of different project types and how dabbling becomes a problem. Dabbling in a new state is yeah. it's almost as bad. And something we have recommended and helped our clients with quite a bit in the area is to identify counsel. If you're going into a state you haven't worked in before, it's our advice to identify counsel in that state uh, that really understands the nuances of professional liability law and liability insurance because it's a finite number of folks out there. So not only do, would you like to identify them on the front end and even maybe get them added to your policy as, uh, if they're not on the panel and negotiate that uh, so they're not conflicted, but to also get good advice regarding the you know what the nuances of that state are because yeah. these laws. Okay, there's one other situation I'd like to tag on to this discussion, which is a situation that comes up fairly frequently, which is there's a breakdown in relationship between an owner and their design firm. Design firm A is fired. Design firm B is is hired to complete the design. And I have, I'm mindful of a case that happened uh, here in Illinois where the design professional got indemnification from the client, that if there was ever any kind of claim from design firm A, they would be indemnified as part of their effort. Well, the claim happened. They went, they completed the plans. Design firm A was watching because they were owed money and uh, they saw somebody else finish the plans and they sued design firm B for copyright infringement. Well, we turned to the client and said, would you please indemnify us like you promised? And they said, sorry, that restaurant went under. We're bankrupt now. So no. Then the uh, design firm A also filed a disciplinary action against uh, design firm B, which there was no insurance for that against losing your license. So I don't know, Laura, if you have any other thoughts on what to do when asked to, to take over a project from somebody else. Be very careful. Right. <laughs> and that's the, the key. Get some advice. Get some good advice. Talk to people. Find out what you need to do to protect yourself. Because you're right, Mark. An indemnity is only as good as the entity that's supposed to indemnify you. Right. And most developing entities are created for the specific aspects of a project and then disappear. Mm-hmm. And single-purpose so, LLC. Yep. Make sure you know how protected you are. Right. So, Laura, this one's for you. A design professional and his or her client can agree by contract that the period during which either can initiate a claim is shorter than otherwise required by applicable statutes of repose or limitation. I'm pulling out my hat. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it depends. depends. Well, yeah. Odds are yes. Because, yes, if you're not doing something illegal by doing this, you, you can't agree to a lesser statute of yeah. limitations or repose. So th that's the answer. But I would say the points, though, we want to be wary of in all this, right, is that, first of all, if there's anything in your contract that rhymes with statute of limitation repose, get an attorney to review to figure out exactly what they're trying to do to you, because I'm pretty sure they're not going to shorten it. And the other point here is that there is a risk of uh, avoiding coverage potentially yeah. under the liability assumed under contract, right, if you went ahead and unilaterally did that. Depending. The potential is definitely there. But again, as you said, I would encourage you to make sure if somebody's messing around with statute of limitation or statute of repose, talk to someone who can explain to you exactly yeah, what advice. it is you're getting yourself into. Right. Okay. So here we go, Mark. Time is of the essence. That's in quotes. I know it's one of your favorite lines. Clauses are simply the client's expression that attention should be paid to doing the work as expeditiously as possible. Wish that it were so, Dan. Um, <laughs> time is of the essence. My understanding is this comes from real estate law, where basically if somebody didn't perform timely, you know, come up with the downstroke or whatever, then the contract was cancelable immediately because somebody's failed to perform. And so this is like indemnification. This has morphed into uh, the architect and engineer and construction setting. And now what it means is if you're one day late, with your deliverables, you're in breach of contract. 
that's all that it means. So this is a contractual liability standard. I would contrast this with the professional association language that says you'll perform services as expeditiously as is consistent with the orderly progress of the work and sound professional practices, which is obviously our preferred language. Laura, you agree with that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Time is of the essence is a very dangerous situation. Again, tying it to your professional standard of care. When it really comes down to it, that's what you're obligated to meet. And yeah. so whether it's time, whether it's efforts, whatever it is, it is bound by that professional standard of care of what a reasonable professional does in same or similar circumstances. And right. as I, I say this when, you know, when they start the contract off referring to the design professional as a contractor, you know, <laughs> read on. It's only going to get worse, right? Same with this. <laughs> if you see this time as the essence, there's other stuff in there that you're probably not going to want to have in your agreement. Right. This time is of the essence is become a term of art uh, that has meaning based on court decisions. And there are other phrases like it position of trust and confidence, which means fiduciary duty, right. arising out of, which means you're responsible for yours and anybody else's fault when in, in the context of an indemnity. And similarly, time is of the essence. It has a legal meaning now. I would, uh, if I can't get any other change, I would like to say time is of utmost importance. At least I'm avoiding that, that term of art. Okay. Next question. Laura. Performance of construction observation on your own projects reduces your exposure to claims. I think you can go either way with this, but I think generally the answer is yes, yeah. because you are there and you are then able to address issues as they come up. Yeah, and I think that's definitely the book answer as well. And I think that the, the important word there is observation, right? That you're out there observing that things are progressing in general conformance with your plans and specs. And as we say, if you're not out there, you know, guess who they're all talking about, right? And there is the fact that from an underwriting standpoint, right, Mark, when you would be looking at and assessing risk, you're asking in your application, aren't you, what percentage of your work are you observing? So as an underwriter, you must have some good, you know, actuarial data that's going to, you know, somehow illustrate why that's an important question. Well, you're right. And the data suggests that the answer I want to hear is 100 percent of the time. Now, to Laura's uh, credit, I'll say uh, the sophisticated answer is it depends. So, for instance, if you're only getting paid to go out to the site once or, you know, maybe once a month, maybe that's not enough. And that's right. actually an increase in, in your risk. But generally speaking, no, we find that firms performing uh, construction contract administration services reduce uh, errors in the construction and they therefore reduce their exposure to claims. And if your client, for whatever reason, wants to skimp on this or, or not have you there at all, or bring in the dreaded third-party CM, wouldn't we want some additional language in our contract to clarify that, what you're, you know, that you're not responsible then? Uh, that would be nice. Some limiting language would be nice. Scenario I see play out far too often is that design professionals elect to do things on the cheap to benefit the owner, but the, the owner does not share in the risk. And that to me is just unfair. All right. This one is for both of you here. Laura, let's start with you. A design professional can amend the contract after it is signed simply by virtue of his or her conduct. And I know being a lawyer, it's hard for you just to answer this true or false. But let's say, what would you think? This is true. I don't even have to say it depends. This is true. I've had I've had attorneys push back on me and say, you know, not really amending it, you know, but okay. You're creating you know, more obligation. You're creating yeah. your own obligation. I mean, that's the problem here is that if you alter this, what you're doing with regard to the scope, you have a set scope of services and you keep letting that scope creep and that scope change and that scope expand, you are taking on more responsibility ability and you may or may not be getting paid for that. <laughs> and, and there's the big point, isn't there, Mark and Laura, that 
we want every design professional's agreement to contain in there that they are not responsible for job site safety, that it is in fact the sole responsibility of the general contractor, right? However, if they go out there and or construction means or methods, however, if they go out there or any staff member goes out there and takes control of that job site, even what's in that written contract, their actions could take precedent over whatever they have in that agreement and they could be liable, right? I mean, that's a that's a concern in this. That is the truth. If you take on an obligation, you're supposed to perform it reasonably. And if there is an assertion that you didn't perform it reasonably, even if you weren't contractually obligated to do it, but you took on the obligation, if you don't perform it reasonably, you've now set yourself up. Or in another example B would be if the design professional stopped the work out on the site, even though they had no responsibility, it doesn't matter. Their actions, contr- right? OSHA could certainly right. come in and has. There's precedent out there where they have yep. come in and work has been stopped and they've come you, after the design professional. They've demonstrated yeah. control of the site. They've taken control of the site, whether they have it or not. They've established and made themselves out to have control of the site. And if you have control of the site, get ready. You're ready for safety. You're ready for just about anything. Unfortunately, this is almost always a one-way street. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say it's always a one-way street. You can expand your scope of responsibilities by what you do on the site. I've never seen anybody successfully limit or restrict their responsibilities by virtue of what they said or did after the contract was signed. And I'd like to go on. And I'll offer one example of how this has happened and, and ask Laura for a, for a story, too. But as a for instance, there was an excavator who, who was having trouble balancing a site. And the frustrated civil engineer grabbed a can of spray paint and walked up and just sprayed a line eight inches above the dirt in the, on the side of a building. It said, fill to there! And then he was deemed to, have, you know, uh, assume responsibility for means or methods when a later problem arose. Laura, I don't know if you have an example or, or two of how innocuous or well-intended actions have resulted in an expansion of liability exposure. A yeah, sketch on a napkin about a connection. Mm-hmm. Literally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A sketch a on a napkin mm-hmm. about a connection. Right. And all of a sudden... You, you've that crossed becomes, that line. It gets into the drawings, and there you are. You've crossed that line, and you tried to help or be helpful, but you, you have to, again, know what your responsibilities are and the standard of care. Okay, last question, okay, uh, for both of you. To help keep legal fees down, it is important to wait as long as possible before reporting a problem to your professional liability insurance company. I'm going with Laura on this one. Yeah. Dan, you're killing me here. <laughs> No, do not wait. Do not, do not, do not. It doesn't get better with time, does it? No, it doesn't. It's not and, auto and insurance. This is, uh, you know, we got we to gotta nip this in the bud, right? You have professional liability policy, and your policy says that you will report a claim. So if somebody makes a demand against you, you better be reporting that, or you're running into potential issues if you hold off, and there are things that develop that arguably prejudice rights. You right. run into problems there. Now, the other thing to think about is, okay, it's not a claim, but something just doesn't feel right. You feel like you're being set up. You're sitting at meetings. You're reading minutes that have been prepared from a meeting, and you're like, that's not what I said. Well, maybe it's sort of what I said, but get some help. All Trust of, your most gut. Of the pro- Most of the professional liability policies out there have what is called pre-claim assistance. You get to report things into the carrier. The carrier will provide a claims professional who has been doing this for a very long time and will help you through the process, potentially attiring an attorney to assist you at the insurance company's cost. Because we are so dedicated to the concept of getting in early and providing help so that things don't go south. Companies put are putting their money right. where their that, mouth that's is. That's such an important policy feature, pre-claim assistance. And I will say this to your point here, we did this, uh, again, this survey of 14 carriers in the industry. And if there was one thing they all agreed on was the answer to this question essentially is that the number one reason they would deny a claim is failure to timely report. 
And that's the hard line. So if you do not report a claim, which is generally defined as a demand for money or service, you could very well avoid coverage. So our advice is to to tender anything that certainly is a demand for money or service, even if you think it's going to go away or under your deductible, you want to preserve the coverage you bought and paid for. If nothing else, bring it to your broker, bring it to your agent, let them help you through the morass of insurance and figure it out. Right. We're here Let's, ready to help, and you guys will help direct them where they need to go. Right. Partner up with them. Well, that is the last DPIC liability IQ question I'm going to ask. And uh, I want to thank my very special guests, Laura Guarliardo and Mark Blankenship, uh, for joining me today. Thank you, Laura. Dan, this was such a pleasure to speak with you. It's always great to spend some time with you, Laura. And uh, it's been a while, so it's, it's this is great. And Mark, you're just down the hall from me, if, if the virtual hall, but we uh, I see you all the time. But it's great to have you as well. It's great to be speaking to Laura again. I feel like we're getting the band back together. Yeah, <laughs> very nice. Some old DPICers. Well, thank you very much. And thanks again for you for joining us for another episode of Talk to Me About a and &E. I'm Dan Bulo, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us for this WTW podcast featuring the latest thinking on the intersection of people, capital, and risk. For more information on Willis a and &E and our educational programs, visit willisae.com. WTW hopes you found the general information provided in this podcast informative and helpful. The information contained herein is not intended to constitute legal or other professional advice and should not be relied upon in lieu of consultation with your own legal advisors. In the event you would like more information regarding your insurance coverage, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. In North America, WTW offers insurance products through licensed entities, including Willis Towers Watson Northeast Incorporated in the United States and Willis Canada Incorporated in Canada.